Um, bird simulation um, is something that um, I've been involved with for several years now, but most recently in the United States, I've been the chairman of the BIRST study, which is a multi-center prospective study, uh, which now is enrolled and fully implanted. So uh, we won't have results of that for about six months uh, to compare. So I'll talk about that a little bit today. But yesterday I gave a, a talk on BIRST for about 20 minutes during the main program and, and a talk on dorsal root ganglion simulation, which Dr. McKell will cover. And we're going to go much deeper this morning uh, into those. So just some disclaimers here. It's, what, BIRST isn't FDA approved yet. Certainly the reason uh, BIRST is studied by the, by the uh, uh, manufacturers is because the FDA wanted the study done. So if someone says they're doing BIRST right now, they're not unless they're in the study. It would be an inappropriate use of the term. Uh, it is approved in, in uh, Europe and approved in Australia currently. So it is available in other parts of the world, which is good because we can learn from those clinicians around the world. And so I think it's been very nice to be able to share experiences with folks that have already been doing these types of things. And I've had the, the, the pleasure and honor to go to both uh, Europe and Australia and work with my colleagues in those areas. Uh, this is my objectives today. I'm going to cover some, just some, some chronic pain overview, which for most of you is a review in, in this room. Look at unmet needs, which I covered yesterday a little bit. And then look at much deeper into the mechanism of action of burst. Um, chronic pain, as we know, is, you know, is costly. It's, it's, it's prevalent. Um, and about 19% of adult Europeans have been shown to have pain. The U.S. numbers are very debatable whether or not uh, the numbers are accurate, some of the estimates, but the, but the European number is pretty accurate based on some of the registries they keep. Uh, so I do think that it tends to be uh, more uh, efficient record keeping in Europe, both from uh, registries for outcomes, which now if you put a simulation system in in Great Britain, you, you're immediately in the registry. So there's a lot of things being done over there that may, lets us track things better. Um, and certainly, um, I think, you know, again, looking forward, um, hopefully something we can achieve here. And we're currently working on a large registry for two different companies looking at outcomes overall. Pain perception is, is an issue. And, and again, this is something new for me. You know, uh, those of you who know me, I've been an interventionalist. So someone mentioned psychological stuff. I, I really wanted nothing to do with it most of the time. And we would defer that to other folks. So um, now we're finding that that we might have a mechanism where spinal cord stimulation could affect this in a great deal. So we have the context, you know, of things. What do people believe about pain? You know, some people believe if you run 100 miles and suffer, that's good. That's a good thing. You know, that's that's the context of, of pain, expectations of pain. There's a placebo effect, and then we'll go into these things: cognitive uh, function, sensory, mood, and chemical structure. So I'm going to look at all that here in the next few moments. I think it's all pretty important. So if you look at the pain complex, the lateral thalamic system gives us pain perception. And then the medial pain uh, complex of the, the thalamus gives us affect and attention to pain. And then those both come down to affect emotions, how you feel about pain, and then the consciousness of where is the pain. So all those factors are in this complex array of why people suffer. And then with that, you have a, this nose of stimulus. You pay attention to it. You interpret it based on your culture, your family, your learning, your cognitive skills, and then you decide how to cope with that, and then it changes your behavior. So we're learning more and more that stimulating a nerve doesn't cause pain relief. It's multiple factors involved in that. And then if you look at each of those factors broken down individually, attention to pain, where people are vigilant about their pain, where they think about their pain all the time, has been shown to decrease function. Cognition, where you catastrophize, where you are negative about your pain and you're negative about your life situation has been shown, I'll show you some data, to markedly reduce the chance of us being successful. So if you have someone who's catastrophizing and they say, well, it's hopeless, I have no chance of this pain being improved, the pain scores tend to go up. So that's, that's been shown in, in multiple studies now. Uh, depression, anxiety, we know can affect it. Um, and then overt behavior, avoiding um, things to, like work and, and social interaction, certainly a factor there as well. Not only is it important emotionally, but it changes your brain. So if you're in chronic pain, and there is some evidence that neuropathic pain may be even more likely to change your brain than nociceptive pain over time, uh, what you find is you get ultra brain chemistry, there's a decrease in your gray matter volume, there's structural changes in your neuro tract, and then you have ultra brain network conductivity. CRPS patients have been shown to really show major atrophy in the gray, gray areas of, of the uh, brain, and localized white matter changes as well. So I don't think we ever thought about this before, that there's actual changes in the brain itself with the neurocognitive changes of pain. 
And to me, that's really a, a thought process that's really new. Also, we've learned from Chris Kumar, and I'm going to show you with bursts, this may not be true. I think that's one of the things about the burst mechanism versus um, a tonic stimulation, and also possibly with high frequency as well, that this may not be true. Chris showed that over time, and Chris Kumar was a neurosurgeon in Canada who had a heart attack about a year and a half ago, a good friend of both Dr. McKell and I. But he showed if you got out to you know, over 15 years, your chance of a stimulation working with tonic stimulation is almost zero. And the theory behind that is, is because people's brain changes so much they won't respond. If you look at this, this is another good thing to talk to our insurance about, talk to our, our referring doctors about, is that we got to get to these folks fairly early. And if it takes them five years to get referred to the Cleveland Clinic to see Dr. McKell, his chances are lower with current therapies. Again, I'm going to show you some data a little later. That may not be true any longer. Um, so the theory is you have neuropathic pain which Wu's work I showed yesterday, and I'll show a little bit today in a different fashion, causes these paresthesias and dysthesias. And then spinal cord stimulation activates the A beta fibers, suppresses the C and A delta fibers, and this is why spinal cord stimulation traditionally has worked. That's been the, the working theory of Melzack and Wall. Dr. Wall said he's not sure this theory is accurate when he was asked about it, so it's still somewhat controversial. Unfortunately, there's non-responders. So if you've done spinal cord stimulation, you've had patients who didn't respond to spinal cord stimulation. Um, so we've done it mostly for neuropathic pain. Certainly the, the question is going to be with new waveforms, can we treat nociceptive pain better than we did before? But about 20 to 30% are non-responders if you look at the data. And that goes, counts failed trials, people who fail to have pain over time. And those who have um, pain that you can't address, axial back pain is one of the most common areas. This number may be underestimated, and some people have estimated the number to be higher, 30 or 40, 35 to 40 percent. So there's certainly a group of non-responders. That's a term you'll hear more as we look at our research. And we look at all the research, many studies now for stimulation, you get a trial of stimulation, and if you're a responder, you go into the study. If you're a non-responder, you stay out of the study so that you don't bias either group. So I think we're going to see that more and more in, in design. The FDA has tended to like that. Paresthesia with tonic stimulation we covered yesterday. You're looking at both barrel and north work. If the overlap isn't there, the chance of pain relief is quite low. Uh, if they have severe dense neuropathy and you can't get overlap of paresthesia in the area of the neuropathy, your chances are quite low. Axial back pain, unable to obtain paresthesia, can be very challenging, but also it lowers your chance of success. Um, so those are things that are good about paresthesia. If you can achieve one, you can't always achieve one, though. But if you look at that non-responder list and you break that down into the failed trial, about 25% of patients failed the trial overall. Now, some of you know a couple of years ago, we saw numbers climb much higher than that for in-office trialing. That was somewhat uh, inappropriate trialing. So if you look at studies that were done based on protocol of selection, about 25% fell. Uh, about 69% of those, the reason they failed was they don't like the way it feels. So they just don't like the way the paresthesia feels. You know, and so it's frustrating, right? You have someone who has severe leg pain, you stimulate them, you do a trial, and you say, Miss Jones, do you feel this in your leg? Yes. Are we missing anything? No, I feel it in my whole leg. Does it help? No. I don't like the way it feels. So that's that group. Um, and about 15% of patients in one study was explanted because they didn't like it over time. The Dr. McKell from the Cleveland Clinic published that in 2004. In some registries now, it's as high as 25 to 30 percent of explantation over time. So, and again, dislike of the way it feels is one of the most common reasons, but there's other reasons too. Jason Rosenberg, who's from South Carolina, led a study looking at a, a multiple uh, patient long-term multi-center prospective analysis. It wasn't randomized though. In the six months, one of the factors they shown that was the most important for bad outcomes was catastrophizing. And those people had markedly significant less relief and were five times more likely to unlike, unlike, I should say, dislike their simulation system. So if you're catastrophizing in that study, looking at paddle leads, perk leads, three lead systems, one lead systems, your outcome was lower, no matter what. Um, and so this was based on studies, uh, testing of the patient, looking at catastrophizing. Uh, if you had greater anxiety stores, you also did, did less well. Um, so in most patients, the other problem was, if you look at these people over the course of time, pain changes. So after one year, 8.3% of patients in that study of Rosenberg uh, had new pain that couldn't be programmed. So the leads were put in because you had pain in your right leg and your back, and then over a year, you develop new pain in your left leg. You still have this spinal disease process going on, obviously, or you have CRPS that changes over time. Those who had new pain outside of the anatomical coverage area had markedly less pain relief. So 
they didn't like the way the paresthesia felt over time in certain areas, and then there were certain new areas they couldn't cover based on the liens. And then the satisfaction then, unfortunately, with new pain went down dramatically, about 58% of patients saying they were satisfied. It was 82% in the group that didn't have any new pain patterns. So I think that's important that you can't change very well. So I'm back to where I was yesterday. Now we've talked about all that problem with the affective disorders. Uh, now we're back to the waveforms. And so we've done the traditional tonic simulation for many years. Uh, you can certainly turn up the frequency of that to some degree, but if you're still low frequency, you still are, are, not, are gonna have a tonic situation, no matter what you do. Burst simulation is a very particular waveform that is created based to mimic the brain, and then high frequency simulation we spoke about a little bit yesterday. Burst simulation, to review the, for those of you who wasn't there yesterday, it's a novel delivery. Uh, you send bursts of rapid trains of pulses of 500 kilohertz, and you do that in, in 40 um, um, microsecond burst uh, delivery, delays of frequency. And it gives more energy at the time, so your dose of energy during that burst is higher to the neural system than it is normally. So you're, you're affecting bursts of energy into the spinal cord. Um, and then uh, not only does it affect the pain, but then there's some definite um, responses in the brain, which I'm gonna go over uh, now in more detail than yesterday. Um, and again, the thing you need to remember is, in the body, you have burst mechanisms in the brain, and you have uh, tonic mechanisms in the brain occurring at the same time. So if you do only tonic simulation, you're gonna miss the burst mode. If you do burst mode, though, you will also activate the lateral thalamus, which does the ton tonic as well. So you can actually activate both things at the same time. Someone misinterpreted what DeRitter said yesterday, um, if, you, if you heard Simon talking, and that is, basically, you need to affect both pathways but you don't have to turn both things on because burst actually does affect both pathways at the same time based on animal models. So it, it certainly appears that you could go back to a tonic mode, but you really don't need to based on the studies. And there's a nonlinear response in the cortex to burst as opposed to tonic simulation where there's a linear response. So there's a stronger signal in the brain provided, and we think it's because of the dosing of the electricity. That's why it's a stronger dose going on there. Uh, it naturally occurs, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, but the cortex, when it's in burst mode, is more, more activated. So it's a more active brain when in the burst mode, when you have a stimulus that activates that area, whether it be noise, whether it be uh, light, whether it be energy, things that activate that part of your brain really activates the cortex much greater than normal stimulation. So to review the two paths, the medial effective pathway, which, which is the first time we've, we, we know of in animal models, we've turned this on in functional MRI studies, uh, affects drive attention to pain uh, and how much the pain bothers you. Where the lateral pathways, which we've simulated for many years, works more on the perception of pain and really looks at the, the wide dynamic range neurons, how they trigger the neurons in the brain. So th there's definitely opportunity here. This is a, a, a piece of work that um, Ricardo showed yesterday. Um, this is a EEG work where they did EEGs to look at the activation of the brain. Burst activates a different part of the brain than tonic does. And if you follow up with functional MRI scanning, uh, tonic versus burst. And this is th what this was. This was patients who had 30 seconds of stimulation and then uh, with a trial stimulation lead. They got burst for 30 seconds, they got tonic for 30 seconds. They got burst for 30 seconds, they got tonic for 30 seconds. And they cycled that, and what they found was that in the burst population, they were lighting up a different part of the brain, but they were lighting up both parts of the brain with burst and only the lateral cortex with tonic. So this is some of the ways the theory was um, validated by De Ritter and his colleagues over in Antwerp, Belgium. Moans published this in Neuroradiology two years ago. The other thing that was seen to occur in all those studies was the tactile um, response, so how sensitive you are to pain was reduced, and so it, it was statistically significant in the burst group um, that you reduced the tactile simulation, largely because of the lack of paresthesia, most likely. So let's look at the clinical work we talked a little bit about yesterday, but in more detail this morning. Um, burst doesn't have to be paresthesia-free, so we talked about high frequency is always paresthesia-free, or paresthesia-independent, as I would call it, but the way it works with burst, you actually go up to threshold, and then you turn it down below threshold. And majority of patients, if you look at pain relief over time based on the clinical data, prefer simulation at sub-thresholds. They don't feel anything at all, which gets rid of the need for adaptation of movement, for example, because there's nothing there. 17% of patients did experience some, some sort of paresthesia, um, as opposed to 92% uh, with uh, tonic simulation. 
Um, and those who had burst did much better in this group of about 65 patients by DeRitter in 2010. Um, so, but the McGill short form improved dramatically compared to tonic, even in those who had good pain relief. I think that's what is really impressive. So if you had the same amount of pain relief in both groups, tonic and burst, the McGill changed statistically much better in the burst group, even if the pain was the same between the two groups. So that tells us that there's a different mechanism going. going. Here's pain suppression. I think um, certainly the PVAQ, which Ricardo mentioned yesterday a little bit, shows you that the burst group has a much better mental uh, outcome from stimulation versus tonic. And then salvage, and this is really important. <clears throat> I think if, if, if you talk to your Medicare carriers, and I, I became pretty good friends with some of the medic medical directors of Medicare around the country, one of the things that's most bothersome to them, they want patients to have access to care. They want good care. They don't want people doing 100 trials with 40 leads apiece and failing, but they, they want access. But the frustrating thing is when you have any medical therapy that's expensive and you explant the device. So if you think about that failure rate of 23.5%, uh, over time, this is a study by DeRitter, this gives us some hope. So the non-responder group was implanted anyway because they do the trial with cut down leads and they were implanted anyway. 23% of, 0.5% of patients, 102 patients didn't respond to the trial. So they had 30 day trial with the lead sewn in, no response at all, 76.5 did respond. And then what they found was in this study, this was a follow up, this was done in 2014 Clinical Journal of Pain. This was a follow up to what I showed yesterday when he had his initial 79% of patients that went on to do well. He had 62.5%. These people already had uh, devices in, tonic devices in, and they had a, a change of their generator to deliver burst. So he salvaged 63% of patients who would have been explanted otherwise. So for me, if you have the opportunity down the road to have a tonic implant that someone does like and they quit responding to shift over to burst and maybe salvage the explant, that will be not only important for our patients, but that will be important for our field because we need to have better outcomes. It will be very important for payers and society because of that response. Now, if you compare burst to tonic to placebo, that's also been looked at by Stefan Shu, published in Neuromodulation last year. Uh, so I encourage you to read this article. It's a pretty good article. I was over in Dusseldorf when Dr. Shu was working on this study. Uh, and what he found was burst was superior to placebo, but so was tonic. So they both were, were superior to placebo overall. But burst stimulation was preferred. If you gave the patient the choice who responded, 16 out of 20 preferred burst. So they, they, each group got each of the three therapies. They were their own controls. But if you ask them to prefer 80% recommend, prefer no paresthesia at all. So I think that's not surprising based on what we're seeing in other studies as well. Um, if you look at other areas of improvement, diabetic neuropathy you see on the far side fell back. And then poor responders to tonic, there was a 77% reduction in VAS in neuropathy patients with burst. Um, and then as well as fell back. So certainly in comparison to tonic simulation, there was about a 60% uh, further pain reduction. So in this study, what they did, this is uh, DeVos and colleagues in 13, they gave people tonic stimulation and they saw some improvement over placebo, over placebo, and then they gave them burst and they saw additional improvement. So there was a ongoing reduction by adding burst to tonic. So it seemed that there is a different mechanism. So some people who fell tonic respond to burst, but also if you're getting tonic and you're doing okay and you change to burst, you may do even better in this case. No one did worse in that study with burst. Uh, so pretty interesting. In Australia, uh, Tony Espinay, who's a, a very nice guy and a very good clinician, presented this study at WIP last year in Eindhoven. And uh, he wanted to look at burst, um, to look at a non-inferiority of tonic stimulation uh, in his site in Australia. 22 patients of four sites led by Tony. Um, and also, uh, Mark Rousseau was involved in the study as well, and Dr. Booker. Um, and what they found was uh, the, the, there was table pain relief with tonic stimulation. They were reprogrammed, given burst for a two-week period. And what they found was even though they were doing fairly well in the tonic group, they had additional improvement. So I think um, certainly that shows that it may be a good idea down the road to have more than one mechanism of stimulation, whether that be burst or high frequency or something else. Tonic alone will have a certain limit. Uh, if, if you've ever rented a U-Haul, there's a governor on that U-Haul. You're going to go so fast. It looks like tonic alone in most patients will get to a certain level. But because it doesn't really affect the effective nature of pain, it probably has a, a ceiling that we could potentially go above with the addition of a different waveform. Uh, and then Australian data, they found the same thing as they had found before. Most patients preferred this at paresthesia-free levels um, and did well. 
uh, with paresthesia free conduction, although some patients prefer to slight paresthesia, which can be done. This is, I'm getting near the end of my talk, but this is one of the important things that is a new concept for me that I'm really, really learning more about. If you look at that group in Australia, which is repeating what happened in Holland, which is repeating what happened in Belgium, which is repeating what happened with Shoe in Germany, that there was an absolute reduction that was markedly significantly significant to 0 0.0001 degree of a reduction in catastrophizing based on the catastrophizing scales. Um, so to me, that that is very telling, and if you think about the earlier data I presented, catastrophizing seems to be one of the major factors for reduction. And I, I kind of think of this as Eeyore, from those who are Winnie the Pooh fans that, with their children, you know, it's the person who's really negative about everything in life, and they tend to have that improved. So is there a personality change from what asked me last night? There seems to be, um, based on, on maybe activating different parts of the brain. Magnification is also reduced statistically significantly. Uh, helplessness is reduced and ruminations reduced. So I think that's um, something very new concept to all of us. Um, pain before and after stimulation. Um, and so better pain relief was the number one reason people preferred the burst wave forth over the tonic. So it wasn't lack of paresthesia, if you'll see the numbers there. It was really they, they felt better. Uh, so lack of paresthesia may be a factor because I think if you could choose between a paresthesia or none, you might choose um, no paresthesia. But 86.4% of people at two weeks of this two-week crossover said, no, I'm, I feel better pain-wise was the main reason that they chose that, that therapy. So in the U.S., um, uh, we have a study ongoing, and now it's fully enrolled, and we're waiting on the data to come in. 20 sites, 116 patients. Uh, that was actually recently uh, increased to, to 154 patients, but they've been enrolled. The data collection's ongoing. Um, in comparison of burst versus tonic stimulation, the patients are own comparator. They get 12 weeks of each with a washout period, uh, and during that washout phase, um, they go back to, to the other mode. And then after 24 weeks, they can choose what they would like to have going forward. So I think we're going to have some, some data. We can't say if, if this is going to work in the United States yet or not. We just don't know. The data in Australia, I showed you, in Holland and Germany is all very, very encouraging. Uh, certainly, it may improve our failure rates, which I think are important. It may improve our uh, understanding of the therapy, or it may not work at all. So we need to wait till these studies come in. Uh, certainly, I, I, again, I want to applaud the FDA for making us do this study. I want to applaud the FDA for making us do the DRG study that Dr. McKell is going to present, and certainly the high-frequency study, which was completed last year. So I think the FDA is doing a lot of really great things uh, to make us be um, uh, responsible to our field. We've never had good, good data before for almost anything we do, so this is actually very good. Uh, going forward, um, we're going to follow up. Uh, uh, we have some interest, I have some interest in bursting the dorsal ganglion, so that might be our next thing we look at uh, once both these studies are completed and we see if they both get uh, U.S. Um, FDA approval. There's new waveforms, white noise and pink noise, that I've talked to Dr. DeRitter about at length. He's going to come visit me in October. We're discussing how we should study that at a multinational, multi-system scale. You know, so burst works because it mimics the brain, but in the brain there's also some havoc, and the havoc is this white noise and, and pink noise, which you can look up in the engineering uh, waveform literature, and so it's, a, it's another way to deliver pain relief potentially. And then we may see a new generation of devices that can do multiple types of waveforms, and we might be able to prescribe the right waveform, just like we pick the right antihypertensive or the right um, anti-diabetic medication. So I think we're going to see a lot of evolution in the next five years, and uh, uh, hopefully Nagy and I will be sitting here five years from now, God willing. So Dr. McHale, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to join this morning. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we'll shift gears now from talking about waveforms and field uh, of stimulation to uh, address new targets. Uh, the dorsal root ganglionospinal stimulation uh, is a potential target, and I'm hoping that I can present you the rationale why it is a potential target and share with you some evidence. Uh, first disclosure, the Axiom, which is the, the trade name for the DRG stimulation in the U.S., is uh, a system that's under investigation. We finished the study. Uh, the data is presented to the FDA, so hopefully we'll have some uh, sort of decision in the, in the near future. Uh, the dis my discussion will include information that could be considered off-label in the U.S. These are data from Europe and Australia 
and I'm just sharing uh, with you, <coughs> uh, hopefully to stimulate you to think about these new modalities in the future. Personally, I function as the, the medical monitor of the study, which means that every patient who is enrolled or potentially uh, enrolled in the study, uh, the records came to me and I reviewed every, every patient who went on the study. With that said, my objective is to just to spend a minute or two talking about the pathophysiology of neuropathic pain, and hopefully I can convince you that stimulating the DRG makes a lot of sense. And then we'll review some of the data from Europe and Australia. And finally, because this is a CME program, I will also compare to other modalities to treat pain using the DRG uh, uh, technology. So, First of all, if uh, this is the primary sensory effort, and this is the wide dynamic range neuron, uh, we have here <coughs> the NMD receptor, and always it's guarded by magnesium ion. In order to stimulate the NMD receptor, which is a voltage-dependent activation, it requires priming, and that occurs through a, sti a stimulation of the AMPA receptor and also the NK1 receptor. And once a priming of the NMD receptor, the magnesium is dislodged and the floodgate of calcium opens and intracellular calcium increases which is actually the crux of uh, all the changes that we talk about in the post-ganglionic fibers or the wide dynamic range neuron. So if you imagine a patient who had shingles five years ago, and uh, there is a barrage of stimulation from the nociceptive afferent that releases glutamate, and the glutamate stimulates an MD receptor, increases the calcium inside the wide dynamic range neuron in the posterior horn. And increasing calcium will uh, liberate phosphokinase C, which will phosphorylate the receptor. Once the receptor is phosphorylated, it requires less amount of glutamate to have the same stimulus or the same effect. After a while, Actually, you don't need the glutamate, you don't need the, the C uh, afferent nociceptive stimulation. And in the patients who develop the post herpetic neuralgia, this circuit becomes self perpetuating cir circuit. And that's how chronic pain starts. Uh, the shingles are gone, no virus in, in the system. Uh, the virus is dormant now, but still, these patients have pain without stimulation. And that's the crux of neuropathic pain. So the wide dynamic range neuron that normally was able to differentiate between the high intensity stimulation that comes through the A delta and C fibers and the low intensity stimulation that comes through the A beta fibers, and this processed as non-painful stimulation, and these are processed as painful stimulation. In the chronic pain state, these cells are messed up. They are hyper-excitable. So every input that comes through the wide dynamic range neuron is processed and explained as pain. Touch becomes painful. Pressure becomes painful because these cells become hyper-excitable. And that's exactly what Dr. Dio was mentioning, that chronic pain it changes how we perceive and process pain. Uh, <coughs> A smart guy in, uh, in, in the 90s, Yakanista, uh, tried to look at the action potential in three groups of animals. Uh, intact animals who are control and animals who have sciatic nerve ligation but did not develop allodynia and a group of animals that developed allodynia and uh, studied the action potential from this wide dynamic range neuron. In the control animal, actually, there is no difference uh, from the baseline, whether you stimulate them with a brush or pressure. But the, the non-allodenic animal, you have exaggerated response with the pressure. The allodenic animal, in addition to the exaggerated response, there is after discharge, after the stimulus is gone, the cells are still firing. He took the same animals and uh, tried to study the same effect with neurostimulation and without neurostimulation. You can see here in this panel the control group. There is, uh, this is the baseline stimulation with pressure and brush, and this is after stimulation. You cannot see really too much difference. 
In non-allodenic animals, uh, the after discharge is, is less. But the most significant one, the, these animals who represent the best model for neuropathic pain, you can see here the after discharge is huge here before the stimulation and it is minimized after uh, neurostimulation. The response here is exaggerated, but the response here is really significantly uh, decreased. <clears throat> we used to think that you have an injury in the peripheral nerve and all the changes occur in the spinal cord and the DRG is a relay station in, in the middle. Actually, the DRG represents the gate, sensory gate for the spinal cord. And uh, those of you who attended Dr. Yakish lecture yesterday, he demonstrated elegantly that there are uh, changes that occur in the DRG after peripheral nerve injury or neuropathic pain. Uh, not only that, the, in the chronic pain state, the perception threshold is decreased by almost 40, 60, uh, 50, 60 percent. And that makes actually the DRG as a, a very potential target. <clears throat> uh, we know from neuroanatomy that each spinal level has its own dorsal root ganglion. And we used to think that the L1 or L2 receives only sensory input from the L1 or L2 dermatome. But if you remember from the neuroanatomy, the spinothalamic tract ascends <coughs> for, or descends for a few segments as Lissauer's tract. Uh, and that's why the DRG of L3 does not actually receive sensory input from L3 dermatome. It can receive input from the whole leg. Uh, the DRG of L5 significantly can address the whole leg and back and the foot. And for those of you who have been doing neurostimulation, we know that covering the foot with dorsal uh, column stimulation has been really uh, difficult. Uh, so we know now that the, the dorsal root ganglion plays a major role in the development and maintenance of neuropathic pain. The dorsal root ganglion is tucked within the spinal canal, surrounded by a very thin film of a spinal fluid, <clears throat> in contrast to the thicker layer of spinal fluid in the thoracic area. Uh, and because of the organization of the dorsal root ganglion, actually stimulation in one dorsal root ganglion, you can cover a, a bigger area of pain. Uh, the dorsal Wood ganglion stimulation appears to capture specific targets, possibly broader than the, the targets that we used to think, uh, because of the interconnection <clears throat> between uh, the spinothalamic up and down, you can actually cover a larger area. The location within the epidural space uh, potentially makes it an ideal structure for stimulation. And the lack of the CSF or the thin layer of CSF requires less energy and uh, the potential for changing the pattern of stimulation with body position might be uh, different. Uh, a group from the Netherlands and uh, Europe took this into task and uh, did uh, a one-year study follow-up. Uh, first of all, <coughs> identified potential patient trial, those who went into successful trial had a baseline <coughs> uh, measurements and implant. And again, the <coughs> measurements were done one week, four weeks. Every patient have the stimulator off on week five and get another set of measurements. And then uh, two months, three months, six months, and a year follow-up. The primary objective of the study was to look at safety and efficacy, but also secondary outcomes and quality of life measured by EQ 5D, uh, physical functionality measured by uh, <coughs> brief pain inventory, and the mood measured by profile of mood states and changes in the paresthesia in relation to body position. 50% of these patients have uh, failed back surgery syndrome and uh, the other 50 is divided between CRPS and uh, post-surgical neuropathy, people who have neuropathic pain in the groin after hernia surgery, <clears throat> and so on. 
uh, we used to see in traditional stimulation that the yeah, end point is 50% pain relief and 50% of patients. And here we really started to see something different. We have 62% reduction in pain in 12 months. <clears throat> and 68% uh, of these patients achieved more than 50% pain relief that's sustained for a year. And you can see here uh, in the time between the trial and the implant, the pain went up, and the week five where the stimulator was off, the pain went up. Uh, I mentioned earlier that covering the foot has been a challenge for with traditional stimulation. Here, 80% pain reduction sustained to a year, and 88% of these patients have actually more than 50% pain relief sustained over a year. This is the normal uh, EQ5D in several countries in Europe. It's about 0.8%. The average patient at baseline has uh, <clears throat> index of quality of life of 0.3. That's actually normalized, almost normalized, to <clears throat> the normal people who don't have chronic pain uh, after a year of stimulation, which is really very significant. Uh, <clears throat> These patients were followed also by the McGill questionnaire, and here I'm demonstrating two <clears throat> parameters of the McGill questionnaire, the pain rating index and the number of descriptors that these patients use to describe their pain. And again, significant decrease during the trial, and again, once uh, the implant started, on week five, there's <clears throat> a return to the baseline, and the effects actually continued to carry on for a year time. The study also looked at the intensity of paresthesia with different body uh, positions, standing versus supine. And because of <clears throat> the thin layer of CSF surrounding the DRG, the pattern of stimulation doesn't actually change too much uh, whether these patients are upright or lying down. Uh, another study focused on patients with CRPS done by Van <coughs> Buten from Belgium. Uh, the same study design, but looked here at, uh, again, safety and efficacy, but also looked at uh, <coughs> other parameters. Pain relief at 12 uh, months uh, is about 71%, and again, uh, whether the overall pain, leg pain or foot pain, and all of these areas has been improved. Uh, they did a, a, a large battery of tests to look at uh, quality of life and improvement. Brief in, uh, pain inventory has been significantly decreased. Quality of life also significantly decreased. Uh, tension parameters, depression parameters, angry parameter, total mood changes in all aspects actually significant improvement uh, over the baseline. One of the areas of uh, neuropathic pain that we always struggle to, to, to try to control is pain of post-herpetic neuralgia. And if you review the literature of neurostimulation, actually at best it is 50-50. Uh, granted, this is a small group of patients, seven patients who are post-herpetic neuralgia. The baseline pain is actually uh, almost eight out of 10 or 80, uh, and significant increase uh, over uh, about 21 weeks follow-up. For the sake of comparative, uh, this is the only study that I could find where we used to do ganglionectomy to treat chronic neuropathic pain. Uh, ECNOS in, in the 90s compared three groups of patients, those who had ganglionectomy to treat chronic neuropathic pain versus reoperation, back reoperation versus neurostimulation. And uh, it's a very long follow-up, five years follow-up. And you can see here the people who had ganglionectomy as inferior to the reoperation and inferior to the neurostimulation. Nobody does uh, dorsal root ganglionectomy now to treat chronic pain, but that gives you an idea of modulating the function of the dorsal root ganglion might be a better way of uh, addressing that. 
Uh, <coughs> another group from Belgium, Van Cleef and Van Zundert, uh, tried to actually to treat neuropathic pain in the upper extremity with pulsed radio frequency. The first study was observational study uh, and showed 72% <coughs> pain relief, and the number needed to treat is 1.4. Uh, after one year follow-up, of course, the, the effect declines. We tried to talk this further and did a randomized controlled trial. In the randomized controlled trial, they included patients with cervical radiculopathy with positive spurling test. If the pain is coming from the shoulder joint, these patients were excluded. And then diagnostic blocks at C5, 6, 7 uh, to make sure that we are dealing actually with cervical radiculopathy. Outcome measures looked at pain reduction, quality of life, and how many of these patients required surgery. Uh, <clears throat> success after three months uh, per by perceived <clears throat> global perceived effect. And the people who received the pulsed radio frequency, nine out of 11 uh, did very well, which gives you a very good number of patient uh, intended to treat. In the sham group, it was four out of 12, which on the surface looks very good. But if you deeply uh, uh, <coughs> study this, they screened 256 patients. 114 of them has actually positive selective diagnostic nerve block. But they randomized only 23 out of the 114. And at six months, six out of the 23 are still having some relief, which gives you 25%, which modality that actually you would like to use and having only uh, the ability to help one fourth of your patients. So people talk about pulsed radio frequency, it is safe, but not because it's safe, it is, it's actually effective. Uh, Six out of 23 patients in six months, that's not really something that we should uh, <coughs> be excited about. Uh, in conclusion, <coughs> the dorsal root ganglion stimulation provides us with a focal therapy. Uh, it is always unilateral. Uh, we have always seen that we put the, the, the dorsal column stimulation to treat the right leg, but most of the time we get also the left leg. So this enables us to actually provide focal therapy uh, to treat areas that's difficult to target anatomically. Uh, the degree of paresthesia is much less than dorsal spinal uh, column stimulation. Because of the minimal uh, spinal fluid surrounding the dorsal root ganglion, uh, there's no change with position. The power requirements is much, much less. It is in the range of five to 10% <clears throat> of the power requirement in posterior column stimulation. Lead migration and, and the series that I shared with you is in the range of one to 2%. Uh, <clears throat> and the dorsal column stimulation in, best, in the best hands, it is 15, sometimes more percent. Uh, it might help in difficult cases and also potential new indications. In my mind, I think uh, hopefully in, in the next year or two, we can present to you a multi-center study treating diabetic neuropathy with just putting <coughs> a DRG stimulation at L5 on both sides. Uh, before I finish here, I'd like to share with you some exciting news. Last year, we shared with you the STEM router uh, as a modality of neuromodulation to treat chronic pain of peripheral nerve origin. Just a week ago, the FDA gave clearance to <clears throat> the stem router to treat chronic pain, which is really excited, exciting. And I'm hoping next year we'll, we'll share the same news about the dorsal root ganglion stimulation. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the stem router, it is a peripheral nerve that you implant as close as possible to the peripheral nerve we used it in people with pelvic pain to implant around the pudendal nerve or ulnar nerve for ulnar neuro uh, <coughs> neuropathy or ilioinguinal nerve for uh, post hernia surgery uh, neuropathic pain. And the distal end of the lead is as close to po possible to the skin 
where a transmitter is implanted and we're using uh, the radio frequency wireless technology to modulate and operate this peripheral lead. Uh, the study had actually 94 patients, so it is not showing here, and <clears throat> the responder rate is much better than the control. Uh, the mean pain reduction is, is great, and actually the patient satisfaction as well as uh, the global perceived effect was okay. It is cleared by the FDA, so it is will be available to us to use to treat chronic pain. Thank you.